D.C. sports fans looking to get their fix will have to cross into Virginia to see their favorite teams. As local news outlets reported, the owners of the Washington Wizards basketball team and Washington Capitals hockey team have made an agreement with Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin to move the teams across the Potomac to nearby Alexandria, Virginia. Reasons for the move include failing and expensive arenas in the District of Columbia, a deal to build new infrastructure in Virginia, and the Capitals' skyrocketing crime rates. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser is attempting to convince the teams to stay in the nation's capital, but is doing a poor job. During a press conference yesterday, the mayor took a swipe at Virginia traffic while then failing to name the metro lines that fans take to see the teams play. Watch. I'm the D.C. mayor. I'm not an <laughs> expert on their crime, but that, that traffic is notorious. So people know about it. And um, I think which lines go to that station? Blue and yellow. Blue and yellow. So every line goes to gallery place, uh, right? Red, blue, orange, and yellow. Yellow and green. Is that right? I think that's right. Not that's quite a right, embarrassing I'm afraid. to not know the subway. <laughs> it reminds me of when Andrew Yang was running and he said his favorite subway station was Times Square. Buddy, that's nobody's favorite subway station. <laughs> A lot of politicians don't take public transit. Yeah, exactly. And the metro is, of course, completely underwater financially anyway. Um, but just to give the right answer, it is red, green, and yellow. Um, but she points out traffic as being a reason why people shouldn't want to go to sports games in Virginia. The Potomac Yard Metro Station, where this new arena will be located, is actually brand new. They just spent the last two years or so um, shoring up the line that runs to Potomac Yard. I used to live in Crystal City, which is not far down the road. And I will say that if they were going to move the arenas anywhere in Virginia, that's probably the right place for it. They have a lot of land there. There's not much development yet, so there's plenty of space for them to add the other things that they've been talking about, whether it's a training facility, um, new apartment complexes, all of that jazz. There's plenty of space for it. They were already planning on doing a ton of development in Potomac Yard. So just from a location standpoint, this does make sense. Now, I've always been concerned as a Virginian of the potential for these sports, billionaire sports owners to get tons of taxpayer money in order to try to draw their stadiums and arenas to various states. I don't want to pay to subsidize a billion Billionaires sports team. Definitely not. In this case, I would say that the deal that Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin put together with Ted Leonsis is actually not bad. Basically, he just agreed to lease this land to Leonsis for 40 years, and Leonsis will actually pay off the cost of developing this location over that time period. So none of this is coming from existing taxpayer funding, which is great to hear. I also think that this is an obvious self-inflicted wound for Washington, D.C. For a long time, Capital One Center was, uh, well, before that it was the Verizon Center, but for a long time was sort of the heart of Chinatown. People would would flood into the area for all kinds of sporting events. I went to Georgetown, so I would go to basketball games there all the time. And the crime issue has really uh, started to get out of control, specifically in that part of the city. It's kind of Chinatown and Navy Yard that have been the epicenters of a lot of the carjackings and other issues that have been going on, especially with young people in D.C. And so for Mayor Bowser to not acknowledge that the crime problem in D.C. is a big reason why people don't want to go downtown anymore, particularly after after the pandemic is really missing the mark. I think Mayor Bowser's got such a rough history on handling crime. First things first, relying on data-driven policy to make decisions about public safety with the lab at DC is extremely disconcerting at a time when nearly everyone in America was like, okay, we're seeing that there is a rise of police brutality. We're seeing unarmed black men get murdered it sounds like what many people want is for police officers to wear body-worn cameras. This was a solution that came out of, of public pressure. And it was a pretty common ground solution when you had calls for defunding the police. This was something that they could do that would improve the community's trust in public safety much more than what it was before. So what does Mayor Bowser do? She decides to run a study with the lab where you have officers broken up into two groups, a randomized control trial, some officers assigned to wear cameras, others not assigned to wear cameras. And then there was measurement of the amount of reports of excessive use of force during the period of the study. 
Now, they had to consistently report to uh, the, the city council and the mayor the hours of footage that they had logged. And it was minimal. Cops that had worked for six months had one to two hours of footage when they were assigned to wear a camera. It was found that officers were not turning them on during interactions. They were not charging them, so they would be dead for the entirety of the day. And then the finding of this study was that they have no effect. Yes, of course, you didn't have compliance in your study. Of course, the body-worn cameras had no effect on policing behavior. And so the solution then, policy-wise, was we're going to trust this terribly botched study that ran front page on the New York Times and not invest in cameras across the city of D.C. and force all of our officers to wear them and turn them on for every interaction. And then you have the rise of crime, which is also a policy decision by the mayor. When you have so many people coming in as Deloitte consultants to do government and public servicing work, they're purchasing apartments, they're driving up rent costs, they're pushing out D.C. residents, and you have this gentrification happening and a lack of economic opportunity for people, and the economic opportunity they have is to rob the cars of the consultants coming in and moving to D.C., displacing them. There's a lot of policy questions around Mayor Bowser's uh, time in public office in D.C., and the way that it becomes such an important topic of having sports teams in a town for politicians, it's absolutely insane. She should focus on increasing economic opportunity, reducing housing costs, and actually doing something about the police force in D.C., rather than focusing so much time on keeping a sports team. It's absurd that politicians are so obsessed with keeping sports teams uh, in their districts and in uh, their lines cut. Even in city council in L.A., we've seen fights over this. Yeah, the D.C. City Council actually just voted to offer $500 million in renovations to Capital One Arena to try to get the teams to stay. But uh, poverty and gentrification have been a problem in D.C. for the past two, three decades. So I think the idea that the gangs of teenagers running around holding people up at gunpoint, crashing into the back of their cars to use that as an opportunity to carjack people is merely the result of economic disparities I don't think is accurate. There's something specific happening in D.C. over the past five years that has driven up both violent crime as well as these types of crimes of opportunity. And we have to point fingers, I think, at the D.C. City Council. Muriel Bowser admittedly has a very scattered track record when it comes to the way she wants to handle crime. She's been endorsed by the D.C. Police Union over and over again. She has called for actually increasing their budget as the D.C. City Council wants to decrease it, and has generally at least given lip service to the idea that policing needs to be enforced uh, more strongly in the D.C. area. However, she has also signed on to legislation passed by the D.C. City Council that removes a lot of consequences for young offenders. So in D.C., if you're under the age of 25, this was a bill advanced by Charles Allen, one of the D.C. City Council members. If you commit a violent crime, um, including murder, if a, you serve 10 to 15 years and earn good behavior, essentially, you could be released by the time you are 35, 40 years old on a murder charge and numerous other violent crimes. And so they have reduced penalties in many cases or refused to prosecute some of these crimes that young offenders in particular are getting into over the past five or six years with a rise during the pandemic. Um, so they've sent the signal to these people, these kids, that they can hurt people, they can steal, they can hold people at gunpoint, and they're not going to do much prison time. And this has been advanced by the Biden administration as well, where they are trying to push for local and state prosecutors to avoid going after youth gang members. And so what the gangs are doing now is they're actually requiring minors to commit um, the, the murders or the other um, violent crime that they tend to commit through their gang activities because they know that those young people will be out on the street soon again. So criminals are definitely taking advantage of a lot of the crime changes in terms of policy that have been going on in cities for quite some time. Muriel Bowser has obviously a huge part to play in that in both directions. Unfortunately, we're out of time. We'll be back with more Rising after this.